All right, good morning, good evening, everyone. Um, this is session 10 of MOOC 4 of the Digital Currency Program at the University of Nicosia. Today we're covering uh, regulation and cryptocurrencies. Hope mm -hmm. everyone had a great weekend. Today we're doing this on a Monday, uh, not a Friday as usual. Uh, we'll do the normal thing. I'll go through a few questions that were submitted in advance, and then we'll discuss if there are any other questions uh, from the group. The first question is the following. Does the dollar fluctuate in value from week to week? If yes, I think it does. Current record keeping requirements in the US do not require people to calculate how much their individual dollars spent in a week fluctuate in value, to my knowledge. How have companies like Overstock helped consumers solve this conundrum in online Bitcoin sales? Okay, well, those are actually two questions uh, packed into one. I'll answer the first question, then I'll answer the second question. Uh, of course, the dollar fluctuates in value week to week, but it fluctuates in value relative to the currencies of other countries. So to the degree that you are transacting in dollars in the United States, that it is your unit of account, then these fluctuations don't matter at all. So if a TV is $300 and I have $300 in my pocket and the dollar drops 10% relative to the yen, both the TV's cost in dollars and the value of my actual dollars has dropped 10%. And so there's really no effect. There's nothing to calculate. There's nothing to record keep. Now, <clears throat> let's talk about the counter examples. Let's say I am a business and I am a U.S. business and my financial accounts are in U.S. dollars, but I have operations in France. And in France, it uses the euro, and my operations in France are denominated in euros, and the exchange rate from euros to dollars changes, then I would have to record these differences in my books at the end of the year as a currency gain or loss, and it would be added or subtracted from my net income. So this is, if you look at the statements of multinationals, at the bottom of their in sometime, some place towards the bottom of their income statement, there is usually an account for currency adjustments. What's interesting is that, and honestly, I did not even know this until I became involved with the uh, MSC program here, there is actually the same requirement for consumers. So imagine for a second that you were living in France for a month and you were engaging in transactions in France and there were currency value fluctuations relative to the US dollar during that time. You are actually support, supposed to report these fluctuations uh, with a $200 exemption. Now, it's interesting, the $200 exemption given that most major currencies don't move that far against each other on the short time frames that people are abroad, typically in vacations, the $200 exemption will cover quite a few people in practice. However, even for the folks that it doesn't cover, I suspect this is a regulation that is widely not known by consumers. I suspect it's a regulation that is widely not reported on by consumers, to be completely honest. I've never heard of anyone going on vacation to Europe or Asia and keeping track of their currency gains and losses to see if they're above or below $200 so they can report them on their income tax return. I suspect also because this is not an area of great ability to for someone to be abusive, I suspect it's not particularly an area of concern for the IRS, um, but it does in fact exist. Now what that means, and this is what's interesting about it, it actually means the treatment for Bitcoin by the IRS is not any different than the treatment that would be for francs, uh, francs, euros, um, though it does not appear to have the $200 exemption. It's just reported as a capital gain or loss. The problematic aspect, and this is where things are a little different, in your day-to-day -day life in the United States, you're not likely to use euros. You're likely to be using dollars all the time. If you go, if we had a two or three or five percent 
Bitcoin penetration in transactions within the United States, you might be using Bitcoin while in the United States over the course of the year, and then you're building up an awful lot of transactions, an awful lot of transactions where you have to report um, capital gains or losses. Um, and so this is something that I think is slightly problematic for retail adoption, to be completely honest. No one wants to think about, <clears throat> hey, I just bought a coffee from Starbucks and I have a 13 cent capital gain or loss and that I need to record and at the end of the year add them all up together and um, report them on my tax return. In practice, I don't think any of the merchants are doing anything. So to the second part of the question, what is Overstock doing to prevent this or help their consumers with this? Nothing is the answer. Um, you are responsible for tracking your Bitcoin gains and losses and reporting them. Now, I will make a counterpoint to my counterpoint. So this is a problematic situation, but it's also less problematic than it might seem if there was ever wide Bitcoin adoption. I suspect what would happen is that this type of reporting would be built into the major wallets and be automatically reported to you. Let's talk about an example that is relevant to most people. If you have a savings account, technically speaking, your interest earned, which is income, has to be reported, is in most banks calculated daily on your balance that day and the interest that day. And so you're talking about hundreds and hundreds of transactions per year. If you had to self-calculate it, self-report it, this would be a colossal nuisance. No one would do it right. Um, half the people wouldn't do it. There'd be all types of problems. And so what happens in practice is at the end of the year, your bank sends you a tax statement that says, this was how much interest income you had. We've done the calculations for you. Please add this to your tax return and give it to your tax accountant to add it to your tax return. And so I think in a world where you had significant retail adoption, that's how things would end up. People would be using one of XYZ wallets um, as their main wallet. Maybe there's a way to integrate other wallets. You would, all of this would be calculated by software and on um, you know, January 1st of the next year, you would get an analysis that says here was your purchases and sales of Bitcoin either for investment purposes or for spending purposes. This means you had the following capital gains or losses. Here's the figure you should report on your tax return. Right now, this is a nuisance. Um, if you have multiple wallets, if you have, um, let's say, and I think this is not uncommon for people, they might have wallets at multiple online uh, exchanges, online wallets, they might be running a wallet on their PC, they might be running a wallet on their mobile phone. All of these things, you have to integrate all of those transactions together to come up with your complete set of transactions and therefore your base, your cost basis for each, each transaction, your gains and losses for each transaction, it's a nuisance. Um, I don't think there's any two ways about it. So hopefully that will, if Bitcoin does end up being a retail issue, uh, a retail currency, uh, I'm hoping technology will take the lead in solving that. If it's primarily a wholesale business to business, uh, real time growth settlement system, I think it's much less of a big deal. Businesses have the resources to track this type of these types of transactions, just like they have to track multi-currency transactions today if they're a multinational. So this is nothing new on a business side, at least for large businesses. Um, I think it is it's technically nothing new for consumers who travel abroad, though I think in practice it is something new for consumers um, because I don't think in, in practice too many people are tracking their currency gains or losses when they travel. So I hope that covers that question. Any follow-ups on that before I move to the next one? Okay. The next question is the following. Do you think digital currency specific regulation creates the problem of selective prosecution. Um, 
I, it's, a, it's a tricky question to answer. Um, I don't. I don't think I would answer it quite in the way that it's written. That it, it's because there is digital currency specific regulation. Therefore, by definition, it must cause a problem of selective prosecution. There's all types of very specific regulation. There is regulation in the world for hairdressers um, that is different than regulation for running an ice cream shop. I don't think that would necessarily mean that there would be selective prosecution of hairdressers. I think what is the case, uh, and I think what this question might be implicitly referring to, is we have seen relatively small time operations in the digital currency space get hit very hard on anti-money laundering charges um, for transaction values that in the scheme of traditional banking have been quite small. Um, on the contrary, you have seen many uh, INT money laundering investigations for large banks end up with deferred prosecutions, no prosecutions, nobody goes to jail, just a fine is paid and people move on. So I think there is a perspective that there is some level of the digital currency folks are being treated more aggressively, uh, less deferentially than the large banks. I suspect there is some truth to that. I don't know it's because it's for digitally, digital currency specific regulation. In fact, typically the regulation that has been used to prosecute digital currency specific, digital currency folks have actually been the traditional FinCEN regulations that apply to all money and transmitters. What I suspect there is a little bit of it going on is that something new is always viewed as scarier. Um, and so there's increased scrutiny of it. And particularly when the regulatory authorities are aiming to establish that as a matter of principle that they do have authority over these types of issues and might aggressively, perhaps over aggressively prosecute people relative to what they had done, what they would do with the exact same topic or maybe even a larger set of topics had happened at a traditional bank. Um, so do I believe that a large bank might be treated more differentially than a small uh, cryptocurrency exchange? Yeah, I think that's, that is the case right now. Um, does that, is that a permanent state of affairs? Probably not. Um, I think in time as people get more comfortable, absorb this topic, uh, feel more comfortable with this topic, it will not be as much of an issue um, as it has been. But I think today, as people get wrap their hands around what digital currency specific money transmitters look like, um, it's important that if you're in that field, you should be very careful. You should be punctilious about following the letter and the spirit of the law, because I suspect there will be a lot of scrutiny on all your actions. Um, as a result of the BIT license, many companies have said they will not operate in New York or have left New York. Can you share your observations on this? How do you see it affecting startups and their decisions to start in New York? Um, I think the reality is that it's a mixed outcome. Uh, and that outcome relates a lot to the size of the companies. Most of the very large, well-funded digital currency companies have said they will apply for the BIT license, are applying for the BIT license, or in the case of ItBit, have even applied for more restrictive regulations. They've registered as a trust company in New York State. Um, I think for these large traditional players, as much as you can say anyone in cryptocurrency is a traditional player, or the ones that are aiming to interact heavily with the traditional financial system, they view this type of regulation as at least a necessary evil or maybe even a positive in that it would give them a certain level of respectability and ability for other counterparties in the traditional financial sector to interact with them more uh, with less concern. So I think if you're well funded, if you're aiming for a traditional style of financial services company, just focus on cryptocurrency, you look at BitLicense and say, great, this will cost me a few million dollars to comply with this. 
but that puts me clearly on the right side of the regulations, allows me to talk to anyone in the financial services capital of the United States, which is New York, and say I'm duly licensed in New York. And um, sure, it's a nuisance. Sure, it'll make me a little slower, less innovative, et cetera, et cetera. But it's also a barrier to entry to hundreds of other firms. So it puts me within a smaller set of firms who have the resources, whether it's capital or intellectual resources, to comply with this law. So I think the larger firms are moving forward in that regard. There are some smaller firms that either don't have the resources or some firms that for ideological reasons don't feel they should um, have to comply with legislation of this type that have left New York State or will no longer accept customers from New York State. Um, I think it, that decision has really an awful lot to do with what your business model is, with how well funded you are, with what you're trying to accomplish. If you're a lean startup aiming for non-traditional financial services, it might not be suitable for you to operate in New York State, and those startups might end up in different jurisdictions, whether they are different jurisdictions in the United States, or maybe they'll be in different jurisdictions somewhere else in the world. Maybe they'll be in the uh, Isle of Man in Europe. And I think that's OK, to be honest. Um, I'll be very surprised if over the course of the next few years that we don't have a spread of approaches among different jurisdictions in terms of how strict they are versus how non-strict they are. And I say that without a value judgment in either direction. And you'll see different types of businesses end up in different types of jurisdictions. And in a way, there's a little bit of regulatory competition in this regard. And we'll see who, what ends up attracting the most firms and what types of firms. New York has an advantage from the following perspective. It is certainly the financial capital of the United States, possibly of the world. And so the big establishment players, I think, aren't going to feel that they have a choice but to be here. And so even if it um, has regulation that might be a little bit heavy-handed relative to some other jurisdiction, it has advantages that it's New York and New York City, and people feel that they need to be here. Um, and that's no different than many other things in New York. New York has quite high taxation, has quite high cost to operate, yet a lot of people feel that they need to be here for the other business opportunities that uh, it has. So um, I think the answer to this question is it really is a mixed bag. It depends a lot what type of firm you are and how big a firm you are. Any questions about that? Okay. As per the exercise that accompanies this section, could you discuss the necessary elements needed to be taken into account when designing a tax policy for digital currency? Thanks. Um, sure. Uh, I guess my view on this would be the following. I think it would be difficult to exempt the digital currency from taxation because I'm not sure what the intellectual case would be that this is the one and only thing that developed economies uh, exempt from taxation. Developed economies tend to have a very comprehensive set of tax policies. Um, you know, as the candidates in the U.S. debates like to mention, the tax, U.S. tax code is 70,000 plus that. pages and covers all types of uh, obvious and obscure uh, ways that you can be taxed on all types of income, assets, capital gains, etc. Cetera, et cetera. So uh, my starting point would be that it certainly needs to be, uh, uh, it would be very hard as a regulator to say, sure, we like Bitcoin, it's really cool and innovative, and it's much more cool and innovative than say, I don't know, petroleum, which we use to fuel the whole world, and we're going to tax petroleum, but we're not going to tax uh, Bitcoin. Uh, I think that's a tough position to take. The second, and this is, I think, a general practice in taxation, when possible, you should try not to invent specific 
differentiators, rules, etc., for specific asset classes and try to follow some general broad principles. So to me, the approach by the IRS to say this is a capital asset, it has capital gains and losses, is about as favorable in that regard as you could hope for. Um, capital gains and losses are taxed at a lower rate than ordinary income. And so, and it would be hard to imagine a world where at a minimum capital gains and losses weren't applied to Bitcoin because otherwise, you know, you could do transactions via Bitcoin and avoid taxes that would have existed if you'd done the exact same transaction in dollars, in gold, in commodities, in real estate, and that would be a very unusual outcome. Now, I would add one more twist to this. Let's say it is going to be treated as a capital gains or loss. I would have put a transition period of five, ten years and say capital gains or losses below a certain amount don't need to be reported. And that amount should be high enough to exempt the likely gains or losses that would come from retail transactions, but not high enough that they would exempt someone running a Bitcoin fund. So I don't know what that, I'd have to run some numbers to see where I think those hurdles would be, but maybe it's $1,000, $2,000, $3,000, something like that, which the objective there would, to be, would be to say, let the sector mature a little bit, let people build the tools necessary so people can be compliant. Let's not inadvertently make lawbreakers from people who went and bought a cup of coffee with Bitcoin and didn't know or weren't able to track all the capital gains and losses and give the, this new sector a chance to emerge. There is precedent for this happening. Uh, in the United States, when the internet first uh, started being commercialized, there was tax regulation exempting internet companies from sales tax. This was, in some ways, blatantly unfair. Um, why, why on earth should you be exempted from sales tax if you're an online company versus an on-ground company? And the on-ground companies were very frustrated by this. But the rationale at the time was that there was 27, 28,000 different sales tax codes that you'd have to comply with whether they were state or local. And the merchants and retailers were able to make a case that if on day one you need us to comply with all of these different sales tax regulations, um, the sector will never get off the ground. And the sector is going to bring efficiencies and innovation to the country, give it a period to um, get established, give it a period to figure it out. And once that's happened, um, we can reevaluate it. And in effect, that's kind of what's been happening. So in Amazon, for different reasons, you know, used to take a very aggressive anti-sales tax view. And then as it has now felt it's now more important to have warehouses um, around the country for fast delivery, it is accepting that it has nexus in all types of states. And in many states, it's now collecting sales tax. By now, 20 years later, it's very hard to make a case that technologically um, software can't look at a zip code and figure out what the correct sales tax is for that zip code. Um, those systems have been built and you know, much more sophisticated systems have been built. And if you're an Amazon, you might have it internally. If you're a smaller company, you can rent that type of system from someone else. And so um, I think it is now more difficult to take the position that online sales need special protection and exemption from sales tax. So to me, something along those lines seems like a reasonable approach. Treat it as a capital gains. Give some cushion to consumers from having to report penny ante capital gains and losses and not because right now there's unlike unlike foreign currency, there's actually no floor at all. You have to report the first two cents of capital gains and Bitcoin transactions. And for a lot of consumers, that's going to be tricky. Um, give them a five-year period, a 10-year period, put a floor in, 
And then after a certain amount of time, either eliminate the floor or lower the floor. I guess it depends how aggressive the floor was to begin with. And under the theory that by then there will be software in place uh, that will make this more practical and it won't be a hindrance um, to the sector experimenting, developing, evolving. Um, that's, that's how I would do it, I think, if I was putting myself in the position of a regulator. Questions or thoughts about that? Okay, I have another one that asks, in effect, if Bitcoin is a global currency, how can the regulations really be national? Won't that be counterproductive? Um, that may be the case, but I think that is a pipe dream. Um, there's all types of things that are global assets. Let's take oil. Let's take gold. Um, these things are traded around the world. There are commodity markets that trade them across the world. Yet, nobody has suggested that because gold is a global commodity or oil is a global commodity that the United States, France, Singapore, Hong Kong, Greece, Russia, Senegal all need to have the same tax policies and regulations. Even if um, someone did suggest that, the odds that people would agree on having the same tax policies and regulation are between slim and none. Um, most countries can barely agree on their tax policy internally to their country. It tends to be a very sensitive and important issue. And countries struggle tremendously to coordinate tax policy across countries because there's always an incentive um, for people to play games. I mean, even within the European Union, which is widely thought of as a high tax jurisdiction, there are many countries, Ireland, the Netherlands, parts of the United Kingdom, Luxembourg, that offer very favorable tax treatment to people from other countries, companies from other countries. And then, of course, folks from those other countries, let's say Germany, get irritated by that um, and think that they shouldn't do that. Yet it still persists, and that's within a currency union, within a political union, within developed economies that all have fairly similar structures, and there's still all types of intra-company, intra-country intra negotiation or gaming um, on taxes. You see the same thing in the United States. Um, certain states, for example, don't have state income taxes. They use that as a mechanism to lure high-income people to their state. Now, in practice, that means they typically have something else that's high, let's say property taxes. Um, certain other states uh, get even more aggressive and are low across the board, including on corporate taxes, personal taxes, and what have you, and they're just view it as a form of economic competition to say, move to my state. Um, many states give tax breaks to manufacturers that move their facilities to their state. And so if someone says, hey, move your factory from the Michigan to Georgia, if you agree that you're going to invest $200 million to build this factory, I'm going to defer state taxes and property taxes for 5, 10, 15 years. Um, some way that is unhelpful competition to the governmental authorities at large across the whole country, if you think about it. It reduces the amount of taxes that are collected at the aggregate level, and this is even within a country, the United States, but yet it's tolerated, it happens, it's, I see no version of which it's going away anytime soon, and the advocates of it are saying, well, different models Blossom let people decide what type of environment they want to live in, a higher tax or lower tax, and whatever services are associated with that, and let people choose. So given that there is effectively no examples of harmonized tax systems, even within uh, currency unions, even within countries, um, across all types of asset classes that are much bigger and more important to the world financial system than Bitcoin, um, I don't expect people are going to go on a big, long effort to harmonize themselves just for Bitcoin's behalf. So 
I think we should expect that you know have different regulations and different rates and different approaches around the world. And if you're working across borders, you're going to have to find a way to be compliant with them. I suspect there's no other choice. Questions or thoughts on that? Okay, well, we had a lighter set of questions for this section, and it's funny because it's always this case. Um, regulation does not usually quicken the pulse and get people really excited, but I will say the following that applies to anyone watching. It is an important topic in the space, and if you're going to participate in the space, and if you're going to operate a company in the space, you have to spend time and energy on this topic. This is operating a Bitcoin company is very different than saying operating a blogging company. In a blogging company, all of the typical Silicon Valley rules apply. Stay lean, work quickly and break things, keep doing releases, go for it, and then clean up the mess later. Um, that doesn't work as well when you're talking about a very heavily regulated industry like financial services. And many of the folks who got in trouble I have honestly some sympathy for them, um, were applying perhaps very, didn't really feel that it was as real or that these rules applied to them or that you couldn't operate it like a traditional startup. And what has been very clear in developed economies is that folks on the regulatory side are going to treat Bitcoin companies in the same way they treat banks or money transmitters, possibly even a little bit stricter with them at first until they kind of establish their dominance over these topics. And so if you want your company to survive, if you don't want to get prosecuted, if you don't want to accidentally end up in jail, um, I think it's very important that you look at these issues very, very seriously. Understand the jurisdiction that you're operating in. Understand if you have any liability or exposure. And uh, have appropriate legal counsel and look at these topics. Um, there, there does not really seem to be any other way to operate a cryptocurrency company sensibly. And uh, I wouldn't want anyone to accidentally get themselves in trouble because obviously no one starts a startup with the hope of ending up in jail. Um, I'm pretty sure that's nobody's actual expectation. And in the vast majority of startups, it would be actually fairly difficult to end up in jail. That's just not true with cryptocurrency startups. So this is one that a core competency of many cryptocurrency startups is going to be understanding their regulatory environment and taking the necessary measures uh, within their firm to remaining compliant with it. So that is my two cents of free advice. Uh, be careful on this topic. Um, a lot of folks have basically, to answer, Neil's question. Most people have just run across, run uh, afoul of anti-money laundering laws. There's all types of, if you're a money transmitter, an exchange, a remittance company, you have to do a lot of work about knowing your customers, collecting the relevant documentation for your customers, and then flagging suspicious transactions that might be violating the law and making all of the relevant reporting uh, to your regulators. It's a lot of work. Um, banks that have had hundreds of years to work on this, or at least decades in the case of modern anti-money laundering, anti laundering regulation, get it wrong all the time. And so in a startup, if you are not actively on top of this topic and super aggressive about this topic, um, you could get yourself in trouble. And so this is this is not the place to cut corners. This is not the place to say, oh, that's not going to matter to me. Oh, I'm too small. Oh, we'll deal with it later. The regulators have shown that they are willing to go after quite small firms over relatively small amounts on this topic and prosecute people fairly aggressively. So don't just don't put yourself in that position. All right, folks, any other last questions?
Oh, if not, I'm going to end this session a little bit earlier. Um, I think George mentioned we're going to combine the last two sessions on Friday. Um, so please think of your questions for both of the last two sessions. And that means we can wrap up the uh, MOOC formally before Thanksgiving. And at least for those in America, everyone can go enjoy their turkey. And um, uh, we'll talk about details on the final exam after that session and what things need to be done to earn your various certificates and participation certificates and achievement certificates. So, oh, Simon had a question. No, I did not see it in my log about custodial control. Why don't you ask it now? And I'll see if I can answer it. I'll give him a second to write it up. Okay, we now have Simon's question, which is very, very technical. One of the processes requiring a bit license is defined as securing, storing, holding, or maintaining custody or control of virtual currency on behalf of others. Bit license language does not seem to take into account the difference between full and partial custodial control of funds, taking a one size fit all approach, even though this point has been raised during the common period. Why were these comments ignored uh, by the NYDFS? Um, Gosh, uh, that's a question that many people would like to know the answer to. Uh, this was one of the main items discussed during the comment period. And in fact, the final regulations did not come out uh, the way people had hoped on this topic. I have no idea why uh, that was how the final regulation was written. If I had to guess, and this is a wild guess, is they were just taking a safer than sorry approach. Um, Custodial custodians of assets tend to be heavily regulated. Maybe they thought if they started to distinguish, people would find a loophole within those different uh, differentiators of custodial control and take advantage of them and in effect have custodial control but manage to avoid the regulations. And they said let's be stricter at first and then maybe we can always loosen up later. But let's start with a strict approach. To be honest, though, I mean, that's just a wild guess. It's a hypothesis. Um, as far as I know, their reasoning was not revealed as to why they made that decision. And Simon had an additional question. Um, what would be the regulatory implications for a blockchain-issued IPO, e.g., with shares issued as colored coins on the Bitcoin blockchain, uh, t0.com, if and when DAX are implemented, how could these regulations be enforced? Well, I think that's actually two questions. The first part of the question is, I'm assuming, what if you're a traditional company, you're Antonis Palomides' Lemonade Stand Incorporated, and you issue shares on blockchain? My assessment is that all the different, lang all the different regulations that would apply to issuing shares, whether it is um, for a small company, a large company, would still apply to me, the company, the Antonis Polymedes, that is selling lemonade uh, here on the New York City sidewalk. So uh, it does not strike me as the, the mechanism by which you issue shares is going to be that compelling to a regulator to say, like, oh, well, if I would have to comply with certain disclosure requirements or certain number of investor requirements, if I issue these shares traditionally, 
that if I issue them on the blockchain, somehow those regulations go away. So for a normal business using an unusual method of issuing shares, aka the Bitcoin blockchain, I would expect all the normal regulations would apply. Now, you mentioned DAX, so DAX are digital autonomous corporations, so these would be, um, not really seen them in practice, but let's let's imagine one for a second. Let's say I was uh, a piece of software that did transcoding, and I did not actually have a corporate entity per se. I, move from cloud to cloud providers, providing certain services. I issued invoices, again, all algorithmically to other uh, machine-led services. I delivered files, again, algorithmically to other machine-led services. And then I had a certain revenue, income, etc. And then I issued shares on the blockchain for um, shares in this economic activity that's working. Okay, first of all, you know, those don't exist in practice today, but I do think, in fact, they will exist in practice within our lifetimes. I think the regulations are don't capture them well. Um, I think they will cause a challenge to the regulations from the perspective that there's not ultimately a human you can go after. So whether you are an individual, I am a sole proprietorship, Antonis Polamidis, uh, lemonade stand, not incorporated. Well, then that's just me operating as a legal, physical person. If I'm a company, well, I have a board of directors, I have a CEO, there are folks, again, humans, that can be held responsible for the actions of the company. If I'm a DAC and there's no necessarily human involved, that becomes interesting. Um, here's how I suspect it's going to play out. I think eventually someone will figure this out, put these out there, say, hey, there's nothing to touch, there's no one to subpoena, there's no one uh, to go after. I suspect the state's response will be to go after their hosting providers. And there, where I suspect it all plays out, ultimately, is people will invent a new type of legal entity as they've invented over the years, first the C Corp, LLCs, LLPs, and so on, to account for entities that appear to be profit-seeking, um, but well, I guess it could be profit-seeking or not profit-seeking, but do not have a human owner or controller. And eventually some jurisdiction will offer this type of entity, um, and it's going to say, look, maybe you'll pay a low tax rate, but if you are incorporated as this type of entity, Mr. DAC, it also gives you protection that you can operate within the constraints of our society and interact with other companies and other individuals. And um, I think that will happen. I mean, this is very futuristic. I've thought about this quite a bit. Um, I think that's how it plays out in practice. I suspect the answer of, hey, people can just operate uh, Outside regulations, tax-free, is unlikely to be the case. I do think DAX will, propose, will present a new regulatory challenge to regulators that are not um, quite the same as existing businesses. And I think ultimately there will be some compromise found in the middle, which might be in the form of a new type of legal entity. Good questions. Quite technical questions. Any other questions? Well, if that's it, we will wrap up this week's session. We will see you guys all again on Friday uh, to handle uh, sessions 11 and 12. And that will be our uh, final session together. So I look forward to seeing you all then. As always, please submit questions uh, in advance to George. It's 
helpful to help us structure uh, the session and have some things to discuss. And uh, otherwise, have a great week. Thanks, everyone.